My name is Birgit Greiner. I'm a senior lecturer in uh, UCC in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. Uh, I'm also running the master's program in occupational health. And I'm happy to be here. I uh, just uh, was informed about it two days ago <laughs> because I had to, on short notice, replace a colleague who couldn't be here. So bear with me, um, the uh, title changed slightly from, or is different from what you've seen in the program. Um, I'm going to address um, the psychosocial side of manual handling practice. Um, question is, do people really do what they are trained to do? And that's my overview. Now, I'm coming from a scientific perspective, not uh, from a practitioner's perspective. However, I would like to um, really break um, the scientific evidence down into a practitioner-relevant uh, knowledge. So hopefully, um, bear with me in this presentation. Um, I, my intention is to put manual handling into the wider context of um, musculoskeletal injuries and uh, look a little bit into assumptions we sometimes have about how musculoskeletal injuries are caused because they may um, this query may inform us also about um, necessary um, solutions. We look specifically into biomedical and psychosocial risk factors for work-related musculoskeletal um, disorders. However, I will focus on the psychosocial side. I leave the biomechanical to the ergonomists in, uh, who are also here in the room. Um, I um, want to discuss in, in detail what are psychosocial risk factors, and here specifically the risk management approach and demystify psychosocial risk factors a little bit and then focus on training transfer and here specifically again on psychosocial factors so do people actually do what they are trained to do in a practice situation and um, I will show you a few um, research examples and some research evidence. Now, the scientific perspective is often equated with an ivory tower, and um, so I looked up um, ivory tower um, on Google and um, was informed it was, um, originates from the biblical Song of Solomon. However, it was then later on very much used to designate a world or atmosphere where intellectual engage and pursuits that are disconnected from the practical concerns of everyday life. Um, it's usually used in a pejorative um, connotation and um, it means in the academic context often um, useless research is done or academic elitism. So hopefully, and that has been in uh, my endeavor um, all along my career, I can kind of um, leave the ivory tower of academics and really come down to the basics, which is kind of the motto of this conference, and um, uh, produce um, research uh, um, evidence that is relevant to practice. Now, the research what the, what the research or the scientific perspective has to offer is theory. So I will kind of show you a little bit of theory that is practice related and also research findings or empirical evidence. In terms of theory, what I sometimes hear is, oh, why do we need to engage in theory? Um, this is again ivory tower and not relevant to practice. Um, I like to um, use a quotation here from um, Kurt Levine, which is a, a famous German professor in psychology and philosophy who um, once said, and this is widely quoted, there's nothing so practical as a good theory because it guides 
the questions we ask. It guides what kind of data we collect, what we monitor, and it guides um, the design of our solutions. So this is why I'm going to show a little bit of theory here in this context. A few assumptions about musculoskeletal injuries and manual handling. Um, Work-related musculoskeletal injuries are mainly caused by manual handling problems. Proper training will just solve the problem. Most injuries are caused because people behave in the wrong way. Many problems are caused uh, just by poor ergonomic work design. And we just have to educate people about the negative effects of unsafe behavior and they will change their behavior automatically. Um, these are often assumptions we hear. Now in the course already of this um, symposium here, we've heard a lot of arguments that um, may kind of um, may us um, query these assumptions a little bit. Now, if we look into um, risk biomechanical risk factors, and I'm not um, gonna go in depth into these for musculoskeletal injuries, it's mainly what ergonomics um, calls um, high force or high load on our system, high workload, um, repetition, poor posture, vibration that have an effect on musculoskeletal disorders. They can be traumatic in a sudden event, uh, but they can also build up over time in terms of um, accum accumulating um, the um, through accumulative workload. And what comes in between are also, I mean, lack of rest breaks, low temperatures, that um, um, make these um, uh, risk factors, biomechanical risk factors, come through even more strongly. Now, these are probably the issues we're going to deal with in many manual handling situations. I mean, we try to improve the posture while lifting. Um, we try to reduce the force or the load on certain um, muscles or joints by proper lifting and applying proper body mechanics. So that's one side of the equation which is very important. Now the other side are the so-called psychosocial factors. And um, we know less about them, and they have been less discussed. Um, one definition um, is that psychosocial hazards are those aspects of the design and management of work and its social and organizational contexts that have the potential for causing psychological and physical harm. So what's important here is um, those aspects of the design and management of work. So psychosocial hazards, as we define them now from a health and safety perspectives, are not in the minds of people or not in the psychology of somebody. They are a part of the workplace and the work organization. And the second interesting element of that de definition is that they have the potential to cause psychological harm, so mental health issues, uh, as depression, for example, um, or even self-harm and suicide. I'm currently engaged in a research project that looks into um, work-related risk factors for self-harm and suicide in Ireland. We're going to analyze all data actually um, reported to a particular um, registry in Ireland. Um, so that's the mental health side of things. However, that can also cause physical harm. We're going to look a little more in detail into those mechanisms here. This is where the theory comes in. Often we look, we see psychosocial issues as something that is mental health related, which is a major part of it. 
but it's also physical health related. And um, as I will show also specifically to musculoskeletal health as one of the pathways. Um, now, sex social hazards are often discussed in the context of work stress. So some of you may be more familiar with this term. I try to avoid the term stress because it has so many different meanings. Um, it has a legal meaning and it is kind of tainted and loaded with um, meanings. So I prefer the term psychosocial hazards. Now, there are several psychosocial hazards with, um, have been shown to be associated with musculoskeletal injuries. Um, the ones that are the best researched are um, high work demands or high effort during work. So to have, if you have to work very fast at high pace, high workload, um, another dimension is work control or influence over work or decision latitude. So how much people can decide, have input into their work, into their work organization or scheduling and timing. Um, social support from supervisors and co-workers is another important impact. So. Uh, it has shown that those with high social support have less musculoskeletal disorders. So it seems to be a protective, a positive um, element in, the wor in, in work, as is work control and decision latitude. Role of conflict and role uncertainty refers to um, if your role isn't clear, changing all the time, no clear rules, you really know, don't know what your remit is in your job um, and or you deal with conflicting ethical issues in your job that may have an effect. Lack of rewards and I go into that there's a particular concept or theory related to that um, so if you are not recognized for what you're doing and um, job change, constant change and change management and job future ambiguity, so job insecurity. Now change itself is not, I mean, harmful, it's the way how it is managed, which is um, puts, um, maybe harmful. So this is just a list that sounds um, a little abstract in some aspects, and what I want to do is to break it really down for some of the aspects, what it means for particular work tasks and how it can have an effect on musculoskeletal injury, especially in relation to demands and control. Now, just in summary, psychosocial risk factors, often in the discussion and also in the discussion with my students who are mostly health and safety um, uh, professionals, um, they often come in with an inclination of that psychosocial risk factors are individual, kind of a response that is different for everybody because everybody is different, are subjective as opposed to the objective environment. They are mainly related to mental health issues, they are in the minds of people, and kind of it's, it's a little bit nebulous as compared to physical work factors, which you can easily measure. Now from a risk management perspective or a health and safety perspective, um, we, can, we um, kind of define psychosocial hazards as something that is actually collective because they are um, underlying human issues, how people react to certain situations in the workplace. So they are quite similar to people. Um, they are an objective characteristic of the work. 
They can affect mental and physical health. They are in the work environment rather than in the minds of people. And they can be clearly described and risk assessed. Now, the, um, uh, the risk management approach to psychosocial risk factors hereby says that psychosocial hazards are any hazards than as any other hazard. They uh, are due to the design and management of work and working conditions. And here is where the change has to happen. And they can be risk assessed. And for instance, the Health and, Sa Health and Safety Authority designed a tool for risk assessment, the work positive tool. So you can check the HSA website. And they can be managed and their risk can be controlled in the same way as for any other hazard. Um, now be aware, this is the view from an occupational safety and health perspective. There are many other perspectives, especially from the, psycho, uh, from the psychological side, who see psych psychosocial factors more as individual and subjective. But relevant for us as health and safety pro uh, professionals is the risk management side of things. Now, if you want to have more information, oh, the, I had links on the slides, I come, don't come out here. Um, I mean, the Health and Safety Authority in Ireland has brilliant information on the risk management approach, as has the HSE uh, UK uh, website or the European OSHA. They all published fact sheets and also risk assessment instruments. Now, I go a little bit into the theory as I had um, announced. The two main models we have in um, this type of research is the demand control model and the effort reward imbalance model. Because what these two models capture is that psychosocial risk factors often come in combination, not just alone. So, and they have very specific like, uh, effects. So the probably most famous model is the demand control model or job strain model by uh, Robert Koresik. And it has two dimensions, decision latitude, as you see on the left hand side, and psychological demands. So it's in a way how much you have to do and how much, you, how much influence you have or much, how much you can decide. And as you see in this um, picture here, if um, people have a combination of very high psychological demands, they have to do a lot, but cannot decide or have, cannot um, kind of influence how they are doing it, when they are doing it, um, so the decision latitude or the control is low. That's the high strain group. Um, here depicted in red, and here is where the risk for the uh, for um, the uh, psychological strain and physical illness is the highest. So a combination of high psychological demands at work and low decision latitude. And you may all have experienced the situation personally. You have a lot to do on your job. You have, a deadline. you have tight deadlines. You work very intensely. If you have impact on the timing of the deadlines and that you maybe postpone some things and do them later, so you have kind of a certain level of decision latitude, it eases off the stress. So one of the solutions in a kind of risk management of these high strain jobs wouldn't probably be necessarily uh, be to give people less to do, but to increase um, their possibility for, for planning and influencing and it and maybe doing it more efficiently that way. And there have been numerous studies using this concept in the occupational health epidemiology literature. And um, these high strain jobs have been, for instance, associated 
with cardiovascular disease, heightened blood pressure, myocardial infarction, mortality due to heart disease. So this is really hard um, epidemiological data in sound epidemiological follow-up studies. They have been also associated to musculoskeletal disorders. So people on high strain are more likely to suffer musculoskeletal disorders. Um, another theory that has more recently been developed is the model of effort-reward imbalance, um, developed by Johannes Siegrist, a German um, uh, scientist. And what he says is, this is very similar to the demand control model, however it takes a little different slant, is that the highest strain is in those kinds of jobs where you have, a, have high demands, high obligations. You put in a lot of effort into your job, however on the other side it's not rewarded it's not recognized, either through income, through your career mobility and promotion, job security or respect you get. So, and the higher the imbalance between the two, the more stressful. Because people get into a mode of overcommitment, trying to get recognized, even working harder. Some of you may know may know that pattern, um, you are desperately striving to be successful. And um, again, this model sparked a lot of research and produced um, very sound epidemiological evidence again with cardiovascular disease and heart disease and also with musculoskeletal injuries. Some people try to, I mean, compare both models and both seem to be measuring something slightly differently, but both seem to be highly predictive of heart disease as well as musculoskeletal injury. So they're both well valid in a way, um, just depicting two different mechanisms. Um, just um, to um, move a little further down to the basics, I would like to show you a very um, kind of concrete example of um, a study which was done in Sweden and um, that compared um, different work organizations um, in terms of how much psycho uh, psych psychological workload they put on people as well as physical workload. The idea behind it is work organization is in the core of it all. Um, and, and that study was done with cleaners. Cleaners are known to have a high rate of musculoskeletal disorders due to very hard physical work. Um, and here the question was, are differences in physical workload, psychosocial work factors and musculoskeletal disorders attributable to work organizational factors. Now the objective of the study was, um, oops, no, I tried to find um, pictures just to illustrate cleaning jobs a little bit on Google and uh, I was amazed about the interesting pictures I found such as this one, which looks like it's an easy job to do. A slightly more sexist one. That one, even at older age, you can still smile when you're cleaning. And the last one probably nears the reality of professional cleaning a little more. As you see already, the posture here, probably not the best. And um, high physical and repetitive work. So no wonder that cleaners have a high rate. The question is, is it just the physical workload? And 
Interestingly, the, the study compared two groups in a hospital setting with two different types of work organization, a traditional work organization and an extended work organization. So let's look how they differed. The traditional work organization depicted in the first column worked with large groups, um, had one supervisor who was kind of at a different hierarchical level, um, had limited rules, um, by, they were determined mainly by the cleaning schedules. Um, the work area, um, people could work individually or um, um, kind of were told with whom to work. The work content was exclusively cleaning. They had an induction period of two to four hours. That was it in terms of training. And there was scars or individual feedback. Now the extended work organization worked a little differently. They um, devised small groups. From that groups, uh, they elected a group leader who was part of them. So the group leader was also doing, was also engaging in the cleaning, but had some extra time for doing more managerial tasks. Um, the work areas were decided by the group. They did some planning at the beginning of the workday. Here's the influence over work, by the way, and the decision latitude. And um, they uh, did mainly cleaning. That was still their main task. But they also plan planned their work at the beginning of the workday. And they had client contacts, which means they also worked closely um, with people in the wards, in the different wards, to decide what had priority in cleaning. They had an induction period as the others, but um, had also further training in terms of group work and in terms of planning and decision making. And uh, they got frequent feedback and it was group based. Now interesting are the results. Um, people had lower physical workload so uh, that was measured, for example, by the heart rate ratio. So your maximum heart rate when you're working hard as compared to your resting heart rate. Um, also, your, the lower muscular load and had an upper arm positioned and movements and wrist movements were lower in terms of their loads. And that was measured by um, actually physiological methods. So physical workload was lower, psychosocial factors were also lower. They were self-reported, people self-reported higher decision latitude, lower work demands, and there was no difference, interestingly, in reported social support, which was unexpected. They also had lower musculoskeletal injury, less complaints in neck and shoulders, less clinical diagnosis and seven times lower frequency of overuse hand syndrome. And both groups were very comparable in terms of age, employment status, immigration status, and also psychological factors. Oops. So the take home message here is I feel the way work is organized can play a big role in the management of musculoskeletal injury prevent or in the prevention of musculoskeletal injury and work organization can have affect both i mean the physical work factors or physical workload as well as the psychosocial ones and which in turn both can influence musculoskeletal health Now, a little bit of theory again. How can we explain that psychosocial factors affect musculoskeletal health? I mean, with physical workloads, it's very clear. Um, but what is it about um, the psychosocial factors? And stress theory may help us a little bit. We know from stress theory that people under stress show physiological responses which is they emit stress hormones which gear up their body for fight or flight and increase 
your whole act, your activation in your whole body, increased heart rate, increased heart blood pressure, uh, and um, so hereby we have also the risk for, uh, for instance, increased um, inflammation, which may pl play a role um, in relation to musculoskeletal injury and decreased pain, pain threshold. Physiological studies have shown that and just increased tension in the muscles. So that's one way of how it may operate. Another way is through behavior. We know under stress that people react differently than if they are not stressed. They are more likely to engage in unsafe behaviors at work. Um, often, uh, we know under stressful conditions, we forgot what we've learned and kind of revert to our habitual behaviors and circumvent, for instance, safety regulations or what we had learned in manual training just to save time. Um, it may also that we engage more in unhealthy lifestyles. When I'm stressed, I usually eat a lot of chocolate. Other people smoke, which is a risk factor for musculoskeletal injury. Um, and other people exercise less. Again, a risk factor for musculoskeletal injury. Um, another pathway is uh, through cognitive um, uh, changes. We know people under stress think differently. Scattered thinking is one of the um, major expressions under stress. You can't think straight anymore. And lapse of, of attention may be a potential pathway towards musculoskeletal injury not um, engaging in um, best practice anymore. And emotional, like nervousness, anxiety, your stress feelings. Again here, that may um, act via tension, over alertness, um, to alter our physiology, as well as lead to musculoskeletal injury. So these are potential pathways, some of them better research than others, and there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, now the main pathways, physical risk factors, they um, act to cause MSDs mainly, mainly through biomechanical pathways, kind of overexertion, wear and tear. Whereas um, it, with psychosocial factors, we have the so-called psychosocial pathways, and I want to show you another example of a study I have been involved in over the past few years. It's called the HIT study, Hand Intensive Task Health and Safety. Um, and my colleague Sheila Nolan, who's also here in the audience, was involved in, uh, was actually um, one of the initiators of this pr um, project, and my colleague Deborah Hogan. And we studied chartered Irish physiotherapists, physical therapists, and sports therapists. The study was IOSH funded. And here we wanted to generate a scientific evidence base for the development of an effective health and safety strategy to prevent upper limb disorders in hand intensive healthcare occupations, such as physiotherapists, and to give recommendations for the development of a guidance document we discovered through systematic review of the international literature um, that there is actually no comprehensive guidance document in this area to prevent upper limb disorders in hand intensive tasks in healthcare. We have kind of guidelines for um, hand intensive tasks for, in, um, for instance, VDU operators or for um, machine operators, kind of assembly type line jobs, who do this or this all the time, but not in healthcare. So something to work on, hopefully with Irish further down the line. We know, this is where our study started from, that hand intensive healthcare workers such as physiotherapists, as well as massage therapists, 
as well as sonographers, they all use their hands in precision movement, have a high prevalence of upper limb disorders, but also of back symptoms and injuries, despite the irony that they treat patients with MSDs. And the associations with physical work factors are well researched. I mean, it's the man in handling issues, it's um, uh, physically strenuous treatment techniques. Most of the techniques physical or physiotherapists use are very repetitive, um, put a lot of force, need to be very precise, are done in awkward positions. Um, so we know all that. What, so if they are all exposed to these kind of risk factors to more or less degree, what tells those apart who don't get the injury from those who get the injury? And these are the work organization factors and the psychosocial factors. Often what we hear is um, uh, alternative non-work related explanations for musculoskeletal injury and we took those into consideration in our study. What people often say is it's not work but the lifestyle that causes MSDs. So people just don't move enough or they hang out in front of the TV all the time. It's not work. Um, people bring their injuries from sporting accidents or leisure time injuries into the job. Mental health and mood issues make people sick or make people report more sickness, also more musculoskeletal injuries, and it's age and wear and tear. So we cannot change that. So we accounted for those alternative explanations in our project and in our statistical analysis. Now just uh, to show you the sample, we sampled chartered physiotherapists, physical therapists and sports athletic therapists, employed, self-employed, um, in hospitals um, and in other community health settings to get a good cross-section of these professions. Our questionnaire included musculoskeletal health, here symptoms as well as incapacitating symptoms, meaning they interfered so much with work that people um, were really um, uh, incapacitated. Um, we looked into work risk factors, here into psychosocial, physical, and as part of the psychosocial into organizational uh, work factors and we accounted for these alternative explanatory factors such as body mass index of the therapist because obesity is also a risk factor for musculoskeletal injury, smoking, general health, um, leisure time, previous leisure time injuries, um, age, gender and um, workload um, that means how many hours they uh, work and how many patients they treat. Um, our sample included, I mean, both genders, um, a good mix of employed, self-employed, um, experienced and unexperienced people, people working only occasionally or very long hours, over 40 hours, and treating um, more or less patients, so we had good variation here. First, the shocking results were our um, sim the symptoms. Here these show whether people reported any upper limb dis uh, symptom, meaning shoulders, neck, um, fingers, elbows, thumbs, wrists, any of those. And you see if in, in the last 12 months, which is kind of the last, uh, the, the, the set of bars to the right. So you see that over 80% actually had experienced at least one of these symptoms. Um, when you look into the specific symptoms, shoulder and neck were the most prevalent. Then the seven day prevalence um, uh, showed uh, similar results, um, obviously a little lower than the 12 months prevalence. But the incapacitating symptoms were also very interesting. So 
25% had symptoms that were so incapacitating that they interfered with work and their hobbies. Um, here mainly um, shoulder, neck and um, wrists. One result, and this is down to basics, input into scheduling, which was one aspect we um, looked into. Those who used an electronic booking system or an assistant for scheduling, their appointments were twice as likely to have actually upper limb symptoms. And that was adjusted and accounted for all other factors, for workload, for number of patients, for um, um, previous leisure time injury and so forth. So, likely explanation, and we heard that from physiotherapists actually, is they can vary their patients. They have difficult patients and easy patients, and hereby vary the load on particular body parts. Um, they can also adjust the emotional load. Some patients are difficult to treat, others are not so difficult. So usually physiotherapists, and I'm sure that is similar in all other healthcare professions, um, have an inclination of what is a difficult patient. They risk assess every patient which is recommended in terms of what it means for their own workload. And as you may notice, I mean, input into scheduling is a good example for decision latitude, and it is broken down to the basics. That is what can be changed probably fairly easily. Other main results in terms of work organization, the higher the predictability of work, and that's probably related to input into scheduling, the less prevalence of um, world symptoms, the higher the influence of work, the less the higher the peer support, the less upper limb symptoms and the higher the supervisory support. Um, so these are kind of the protective factors in the workplace in terms of work organization. And um, no associations, interestingly, with work demands, or, or including work tempo. Main findings in terms of training, those who had injury prevention training were 30% uh, less likely to suffer from incapacitating symptoms in the past 12 months. There was no clear association with non-incapacitating symptoms. Again, this was adjusted for all main explanations and all the results I'm showing here are beyond chance. So they are what we call statistically significant. Also, in terms of health and safety, those who had carried out a risk assessment were 60% less likely to have any UL symptoms in the past 12 months, again adjusted for all other interfering factors. These are just the... Oh, I'll skip those. Um, maybe interesting also the results in terms of rest breaks. Um, many uh, physiotherapists took only um, f five minutes or less rest breaks. Here, these are odds ratios, um, show more than double the risk of um, having any um, upper limb symptoms. Summary of the main results, high prevalence, especially shoulder neck thumb. Psychosocial work factors showed a clear protective effect, and here is predictability, influence, and social support. Rest breaks and input into scheduling um, emerged as important work organizational factors. Risk assessment, crucial. Injury prevention training, crucial. And that may include manual handling as well as other training, and I'll come to that a little later. And alternative explanations were ruled out. Our practice recommendations from the study were we need a comprehensive guidance document um, leading people to test specific risk assessments, not just the overall kind of job of a physiotherapist or physical therapist, but also task specific 
um, in terms of specific tasks and specific patients, um, including psychosocial and work organization factors, specific guidance on rest breaks, concrete scenarios that need to be worked out, how people can have input into work scheduling and control over work timing if possible, continued education and injury prevention training, and here we mean manual handling training as, and patient handling training as well as training in proper body mechanics, training in how to do the least kind of um, strain, the, the, use the um, technique in um, terms of the least strain. And specific issues also for self-employed uh, therapists. Now I went into injury prevention training a little bit and one interesting aspect is injury prevention training including manual handling training is, um, is that really enough? Does training automatically result in behavior change? We all know and we heard no. Does knowledge automatically translate in beha into behavior? No. So, um, what we need is to, an understanding of training transfer. And training transfer is often called or de defined as effective and continuing application in the job environment of skills and knowledge gained in the training context. Now, I'm a soccer fan and the World Championship started yesterday. You know the player? Ribery, Frank Ribery, uh, who plays for Bayern Munich. Um, I, I have to admit I'm siding with a German team. So, uh, training transfer is often discussed in the context of sports and obviously his trainer, Van Gaal, a previous trainer of Bayern Munich, what he tells him is goals are needed, no injuries are needed, and your technique and strategy is needed here. But how do we actually transfer our training into the real situation? Uh, short term and long term, is there scientific evidence that people actually do that? There has been a systematic review of all the international literature by, it was commissioned by the HSE in the UK, looking specifically into training and low injuries and MSD rates. And what they found is no or very little evidence. And they looked at the best studies, the best international evidence, and they said there is no evidence that actually supports that manual handling is effective. Now that's a blow to many of us as manual handling instructors. Um, there was a second review done that particularly focused on the second element here, whether training is put into behavior change. That was done by one of my PhD students, Dervla Hogan, um, together with Leonard O'Sullivan, whom you um, will be speak after myself. And again, oops, the results were, we reviewed the most robust studies, randomized control trials. Internationally, manual handling, patient handling, and the results show scarce research with a focus on training, transfer, no robust uh, manual handling, no robust evidence that manual handling actually results in behavior change. Some evidence for heightened awareness, however, little evidence for behavior change. Now, should we conclude that manual handling training is not useful? Certainly not, um, because, I mean, more research probably needs to be done here. Um, but the research points to several issues. We need to focus more on training transfer, on long-term behavior change, not just the short-term awareness afterwards, and barriers and facilitators to safe behavior. 
And here training transfer theories comes into play. Um, theory by Baldwin, um, who says um, training transfer depends on several issues. These are the three main, main ones. The trainee characteristics, how the tr training is delivered and the quality. And we heard a lot about this um, earlier today. And the transfer climate. So that's a new term, maybe, um, which relates more to the psychosocial side in the entire company. Um, the authors depicted specific barriers and facilitators to training transfers in a company. I'm kind of being a little fast now. We can maybe pick up in the discussion because I'm aware of time. Um, so. Um, there are certain inhibitors that actually make it difficult to transfer training, with some of them being um, a lack of reinforcement, lack of recognition of the learned, lack of consistency and supervision, but also the general climate in a company of supporting safe behavior. My summary is, our job is not done with training, transfer and creating a supportive environment for transfer is important, monitoring and evaluation of training tra um, uh, success obviously necessary so that we can continuously maybe also modify elements of the training work organization factors at the core of preventing work-related musculoskeletal injuries as they have an impact on physical exposures as well as psychosocial exposures and more training and that's my personal kind of um, passion training in the risk assessment and management of psychosocial hazards thank you for your attention <laughs>